valuable aspects of AI as a technology, how it can be used in the architectural profession uh, as a concrete tool. And of course, uh, the architectural profession has evolved over time and the tools that are being used uh, within this uh, sector and field are of course developing alongside and also transforming the field. So in this, uh, in this, um, in this session, we'll go more into the details of the architect's work, the practice of architecture and the daily use of digital tools for building design. And of course, uh, one of the things is, you know, it's not only the very micro practices of an architect that is changing, it's actually also the entire field, uh, the entire infrastructure, the organization. So we see more uh, smaller architectural businesses now because we can, uh, we can have more, uh, we don't need all the in-house specialists, but this of course also uh, challenges the, the different specialized fields within architecture. So these are the kind of topics that we'll talk about today. And I hope that all my speakers for this session has returned from coffee uh, break. Um, so we have, uh, and I would also like to invite uh, my three speakers here that are here in person uh, to um, the floor. We made a little bit of changes in the program. Unfortunately, we had uh, a speaker, a replacement of a speaker for later to today, so someone is changing. Uh, but who we do have here with us uh, at this session is Filippo Lodi, Head of Innovation and Knowledge Management on Studio, that I would like to see here, and Joseph Musil, Architect, Fosters and Partners from the UK, and Pascal Terracol, Architect, uh, DPD. Full, prof and pro full professor, uh, doctor in geography, University Paris, uh, Sabon. And uh, let's do it like we did it in the last session, have uh, a round of uh, introductions to the topic that we'll discuss later in the session. Uh, and I'll start with having Filippo Lodi, Head of Innovation and Knowledge Management on Studio to present. Originally, just for the ones that are really looking at the program right now, Matthias Del Campo is still here with us, but he will join the next session. Um, we changed a little bit in the, uh, in the program, but I'm sure that will work still. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had some good coffee. The one at home had some good coffee at home. Presentation is going to come up in a second. Hello. Just uh, to make sure that we get the right presentation, uh, because we have a change in. So now we have Filippo Lodi. Yeah, that's uh, that's me. That's uh, the pink one. Um, so. My, my name is Filippo and I'm a director at UN Studio where I lead a team called UNS Experience. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary team. Um, there are, it's an innovation and experience design lab. It's about um, 30, uh, around 30 people, um, different uh, backgrounds, uh, computer science, engineers, product designers, urban designers, uh, strategists, all together uh, we create, uh, we are on a mission to create better experiences. Uh, for the people and for the planet. That's kind of what we do. Um, we are uh, part of a um, UN Studio. Uh, UN Studio is uh, an architectural practice uh, globally present throughout the world. Uh, eight different offices, uh, Australia, uh, US, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Dubai, so different parts, uh, but headquarters is in uh, Amsterdam, and that's where I'm based. Um, and this is probably one of the most famous projects, uh, which also uh, shows a different a different take on it. This is a, um, a, a sailor that crosses the, the 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 bridge every day when he comes back home, and he is so much intrigued by the bridge itself that he had tattooed it on the back of his of his body. And that is uh, the stories that we create by doing design. They are really um, story that reflects on how people and their experiences are. Um, experiences transcend uh, the, the spaces. The Mercedes uh, design, uh, the, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, um, which has been realized in 2006, is as a full program of activities. And of course, we link that uh, program to 
to architecture, to, to its aesthetic, to its, the way it's made, uh, and there is an intrinsic relationship for us to technology, uh, the way we had uh, seen that, the way we, we kind of uh, basically programmed uh, components of it to, to have control, to create efficiency, all that is part of uh, the, the history of how we've been doing design over the last, uh, let's say, 20 years, so this 2006, so not 20 years ago, but almost, right? So considering we started 2003, yeah, kind of dates uh, back. Um, and uh, technology kind of, uh, yeah, uh, goes forward, right? So there is a lot of uh, things in terms of control that we've been utilizing in the in the past year. So there's a lot of information modeling. There's a lot of uh, test fit. There is a lot of uh, using data to control. Um, lately, we've seen more um, a sort of immersiveness into things, so, so uh, uh, using technology to translate, so text to image, voice to image, uh, image to voice, uh, there's all sort of kind of mechanism of translation, mechanism of immersing, uh, so you can collaborate digitally through uh, the metaverse with other people, there is real-time imagery, so technology is evolving because the computation uh, power of our machines, the, the 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 possibility that we have to to use technologies is changing. Um, there is new form of seeing uh, camera visions. Uh, technologies get embedded into into our reality, and 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 and, and people absorb that. Um, the the gentleman over here is is, is called the, the famous most connected man in the world, right? He uses all sort of gadgets. Uh, to connect uh, his, his uh, toothbrush connects us to his smartphone, his smartphone connects us to his smartwatch, um, his um, uh, gym program connects it to, to his, uh, the way he lives, uh, he, the car connects to the watch, connects to the street, so all of a sudden technology is is much further pervasive and it's all part of the built environment is is so we ha everything we do is 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 part of that and um you know in in the kind of movie scenes that we see now uh, technologies uh, fantasizing about you know how robotics will uh, come and, and and take uh, space into our lives um and all, all this is just simply part of our built environment. And as architects, we design the built environment. We design with, with all this. Um, second, we know that urbanization is growing. Cities are uh, more, much, much bigger than ever. Um, and uh, there is that lingering question of, yeah, what is the metaverse? What is the mesh? What is the, 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 the future of everything that connects with each other? And uh, as as we kind of uh, yeah, as Marshall McLuhan famously said, so we build the tools, and the tools are building us. And so, and the difficult thing about that is that we are not as as human beings, we are not trained to think how technology uh, develops. So technology develops much more exponentially. Uh, it's very easy to count 30 linear steps, but what are 30 exponential steps? Because technology changes exponentially, and that we cannot do. Um, so then the question is for us as designers, is how do we future-proof uh, the future? So maybe linking to the first conversation we had earlier in the morning, so how do we foresee the future changing? And uh, how do we capture that? How can we, uh, how can we do that? So I brought with me three strategies and two stories that tell uh, how we future-proof the future. Uh, the strategies are, well, first of all, we need to look into relationship technology where is the human and where is the machine? How do we relate with each other in all sorts of fields? Human machines are uh, more intriguing than ever, um, and we we are specifically interested as designer into into the place in the middle where the two things complement each other, where either humans are complemented by the machines, or where the technology is augmenting humans because things that humans could not do on their own. Uh, but it's very interesting where, where that happens. Um, the second strategy is to kind of think at a broader um, systemic effect of the things that we do. So we don't design for human alone, we design for uh, a, a broader, um, uh, yeah, a broader shared value uh, with each other, and uh, that broader shared value needs to be kind of seen. The third strategy is what is our role as designers, and that's where I'm, I'm always fighting every sort of discipline in the sense that I believe very much to kind of. 
take away the notion of, of, the, of the traditional disciplines and kind of work in an integrated way, in a multidisciplinary way, where that is the way we can create um, the, the, the future. So wh what are we as architects, if not uh, you know, the collage of a lot of different experiences and, and taking those experiences with us? So two, two examples of where we apply these strategies and, and what do we do with it. The first is an urban, as an urban design, um, much based on, on, um, on a, a quadruple helix model where we try to bring in different, uh, uh, different entities together to create win-win-win-win situations. Um, it's an urban design. In, uh, in, in the Netherlands, it's, ma it's a master plan called um, Brain Postmar District, um, a thousand uh, homes, of which we are at the moment prototyping 100. And the old master plan has been designed with the notion of uh, embedding technology uh, into it, uh, where the assumption is, could we create a place where every person that lives there does not have to pay rent or mortgage? So everybody that will live here will actually live because the built environment is paying on its own. So technology will help to do that. Um, and what can you do if, if you don't have to pay your rent or more? Well, you can have more time uh, for playing with children, uh, for um, cultivating your, um, your garden. Uh, you can work less. Um, and the technology that supports it is a layer technology. There's a lot of uh, intelligence to connect. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of data uh, um, topics that we had to develop, uh, we had to bring in. Um, we had to bring in a data ethicist to understand the relationship uh, with with data and the ethics of how ownership of data um, is. Uh, so a, a lot of lessons learned um, to create this. And at the moment, there are 100 homes that are being prototyped um, in, in, in this. There, so there's a lot of mechanisms to bring in the different uh, use of, of sort of of, of technology of, of materials um, of constructions and the intelligence that these will have once the building unrealized and they will keep on optimizing that will be used to share uh, information so the, the solar panels uh, you can trade energy with your neighbors if you're on holiday you're not using it and that um, and that brings in uh, forward the second example to a very small scale but deals with the relationship of human and technology, the same as the master plan does in a very large scale, it's much more complex. It's a smaller, a smaller scale, and it refers to stress. Um, we we see the, the kind of overpopulation of, of, of stress being a place. This is uh, what they call the rage room in, um, in, uh, in Moscow. And we created a, um, a reset, it's a series of pods uh, that you can go inside and you're measured um, uh, brave wing length and, and pulsations, this, this type of information um, is condensed into what we call the reset index and every time that you go inside the, the AI, the technology, the algorithm um, learns from the data of you going inside and kind of suggests a different way how you can distress yourself and um, that's a product that we, we created and uh, so that brings us to, to the question, so how do we feel the future? Well, how, do we, how do we do that? And how do we put that in practice? Well, we believe much in, in, in seeing the fact that uh, kind of the world of technology, society, economy, they're all kind of changing together. And how can the design, what is the design line that connects into it? And uh, you know, what is the architect uh, line in it? And so how can we bring in different um, a notion for, for our future and um, we believe much in, in not confining ourselves to, to the smart, to the convenience, but to, to use technology to embrace the right, to embrace different questions and the questions that are more about the nature of value uh, that we can create for the users and um, the planet that we live in um, and to bring that level of, 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 of notion into, into our design. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Filippo. Um, so, yes, please, Joseph Musil. Hello, everyone. Um, just coming up. 
Okay, so my name is Joseph. I'm going to be talking about AI for environmental design at Foster and Partners. I work uh, for Foster and Partners in a small R&D group called Specialist Modeling Group. And so this is one of our, our older buildings in London. Uh, it's fairly known, but it was one of the first buildings that were that was designed in a way that was considering the link between the outdoor uh, airflow and the indoor airflow. So putting window openings in a specific locations and seeing when you open them what happens on the inside to create a, a healthy environment. Now to do that you need to do lots of, uh, well you want to do lots of simulations to actually understand because uh, especially wind flow is, uh, is a fairly complex phenomenon. So on the left side you see you're going to start doing analysis of the outside, it's called CFD. And then with combination of tools you can analyze when you open certain windows what actually happens on the inside. <coughs> uh, now, why would you want to do that? Um, so, you can design spaces for certain ranges of wind speeds, and these wind speeds directly uh, have impact on what people are going to enjoy doing there. So, you can design spaces for standing, sitting, strolling, walking, or you can make the spaces actually very uncomfortable if you don't design it well. Um, so, in this way, you can directly promote healthy lifestyle by, you know, telling people about providing spaces where people can go outside and enjoy the time outside. Um, and the same applies to indoor spaces, but unfortunately, the modern build, the, the idea of modern building today is not far away from building a submarine um, in air. So it's tightly sealed. The air is coming from somewhere far away from the building. It goes through meters of pipes. There might be clean or not. And actually, at the same time, you have the fresh air just a few centimeters away from you, just behind the the facade. So if you could open it and get it inside, you might provide. Um, healthy environment and also the buildings consume 40 percent of the world's energy so if we can work more with the idea of passive solutions like natural ventilation then we can improve uh, hopefully the built environment. Uh, another reason to do that is that <coughs> humans are not necessarily designed for um, like a steady environment. So humans were designed to be in a dynamic environment. So if you look at the image on the left, that's a typical picture of a park. Maybe you have a, a little table there. You see there's a high range of colors, high range of temperatures, different you know, different areas of different temperatures. It's a bit of airflow. On the right side is like a typical office space. It's all very neutral. Uh, there is this idea that everything has to be constant temperature, constant lighting, um, but actually is not what uh, humans enjoy. Uh, one of the reasons is that <coughs> it engages brain in different ways. So dynamic environments engage brain uh, through different multiple senses and create a more enjoyable environment. The right side you can see the thermal neutrality engages very little the brain and it gets boring and not enjoyable. Um, so now if you look specifically at passive solution for airflow, you can actually, you might argue, well, it's not always possible to open windows, but if you look at the map, you can see if you allow for some sort of uh, range of uh, temperatures or a range of airflows, um, most parts of the world will allow you to do uh, the passive solution. <coughs> In terms of analysis, we have a whole range of tools that are able to help us to design that, and they vary in terms of complexity and time. So uh, the main problem is the, the the more rough estimates you get, the faster it runs, and the more complex simulations you do, the more time it takes, and the, the most detailed simulation they can take up to weeks, which is a big problem because when you design a building and you are in a concept stage, where, just, where you really focus on massive changes, you can't do, you know, the later in the project, you can't do changes of the overall shape, for example, that is just not unthinkable. So you need to do, in, at the very beginning, a lot of very fast simulation to allow you to do uh, big design changes. So AI, in this sense, pro uh, provides uh, an opportunity to do uh, prediction of certain simulations with accur like accurate enough that's useful for the design stage, but run almost in real time. Um, so this is one example of how we used, um, so we built in-house a little AI model that predicts the airflow. Uh, this is, for example, a master plan for a tropical island. And the idea here is to play with the buildings in a way that you provide just enough airflow in between the buildings to support the idea of cooling. So it's not too much, so it's not comfortable, but it's enough so you have a bit of a breeze and it feels good.
Another example, this is the opposite, when there is too much uh, airflow on the outside, so this is in Shanghai, particularly in Shanghai, and we wanted to design uh, the blocks in a way that they are open. We don't want to create like a solid wall to stop the wind coming in, but we want to uh, protect the indoor, the inside courtyard, uh, so it's a healthy place you know, to be there. You can go for the run, picnic, um, so you have just the right amount of airflow coming through. Um, Another visualization. The interesting things we can generate, uh, we can predict data in a format that we can plug directly into engineering software with the AI, because we can. It's up to us to decide how we, uh, what sort of data we predict, and it allows us to use standardized tools to visualize that help us to communicate the design. So now what we have is this traditional workflow: is you have a simulation, you get a report. Uh, you influence the design. The problem is, as I said before, it might take anywhere up to one to three weeks, which is just too slow for concept stage. And the second big uh, problem is, even if you have the best report in the world, it, typically it doesn't tell you how to influence the design. It tells you this doesn't work or this does work, but it's up to the human to use the report in a meaningful way to actually make changes to design to improve it. So are uh, you proposing, can we use AI to help us with both? So it's something I call forward direction. We already showed you we use the build a model that can predict the simulation in a, almost near real time. But then we also look at, can we actually reverse? Because AI allows us to make unusual connections. So can we train it in the uh, reverse direction? Can we start with the simulation and uh, ask AI to predict the buildings where to put them to achieve such a simulation? Um, so this is a graphic representation of circular workflow. On the top row, you see this is the forward direction. You take a few buildings, and you uh, use AI to predict the simulation. And then you use the manipulated simulation directly, and you ask AI to predict where to put the buildings. Um, the good thing is, with all these parametric models we have today, we can easily generate whatever training set we need. And you end up with a nice circular workflow where the, uh, where the architect works directly on both on the design of the building, but also on the effects of the building. And you use, in, in a circular way, the AI to, in, like, uh, to influence both aspects. And this is our, um, so we in implemented it in typical architect's tool, Rhino Grasshopper. So it's fully interactive. You can build your models and see in real time simulation. The interesting bit about if you have simulations or anything that suddenly runs in real time, it actually and you spend some time with it, it gives you a little bit of intuition how the how the design changes influence um, the analysis, for example, and gives you a bit of better understanding of your design. It's all run in 3D. That's important because obviously uh, for example the wind flow is a three dimensional problem. And this is the moment when you go into the reverse direction. So you put a threshold on the wind analysis because it's not meaningful to directly manipulate uh, CFD analysis. But what you can do is you can say these red areas, these are the zones, let's say, under certain uh, speed that are suitable for running or park. And what you want to do, you want to design these spaces directly. So you start manipulating it, and you ask, yeah, where, where do I put buildings uh, to achieve such effect? And then because you can directly go based straight into the other direction, uh, evaluate uh, if the simulation is doing what you are asking for. Uh, in the future, the interesting bit of AI, when you open the box, you can start incorporating your know, custom functions like physics-based function to make it much more precise. Uh, we would like to s implement it in some sort of like GAN style, so you know the analysis gives us different uh, solutions to the design. Uh, but really the, bigger, um, the bigger picture here is can we spend less time designing buildings and can we spend more time designing the effects of the buildings they have on people? Uh, because that's how people really perceive buildings. It's through the light levels, it's through the temperatures, it's through the airflow, sunlight, etc. And hopefully I will allow us to make buildings more performing better but also healthier and happier places. Thank you. And so we have the last speaker for now, and then we'll have the debate. Pascal Serracol. Hello, all of you. Thank you for the invitation. 
Um, <clears throat> a few words about my background. I'm coming from a software developer and I've been an actor for um, putting on market uh, one of the first uh, 3D synthesis model um, in the late 80s. And now I am in charge of a master of um, a few of a master which is based on the, and, 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 uh, the, the, we are, we are um, operating a, a chair architecture and intelligence in Paris, in fact. And we have already trained, let's say, something like uh, 50 students on a prospecting way on a subject from 2017, in fact. So, what I would like to present you is um, the question was, um, what about uh, the deal between the, the tools which are uprising uh, with AI and uh, architecture professional? And it, it's not so easy uh, because um, professionals have a sight of, of those tools and um, there is a disruption, a kind of a disruption of those tools, in fact. And, but we are on the go and um, let's say we have to, to displace a kind of automorphism of the architect and we have to, to train them. And uh, we, we're going to go to, to open a, a professional master on that tools. And uh, we invite uh, ACA and uh, maybe other actors to, to join us in Paris for that subject because it is, it's a real goal, in fact, to, to provide uh, the knowledge of, uh, of those tools to, to the professional of, of specialization who are the architect, in fact. So this is a real invitation. And maybe you and studio and maybe Foster, you are, you are where you are. We, can, we can work together. That's it. Let's say. What is the value of architect? So it is a real subject because uh, the question is evolving and we cannot let uh, the, this space open to only, uh, let's say, uh, economics actors or marketing actors, in fact. And they are not so far from that. And we are working to, to open this kind of tools to the architecture fields, in fact, that's it. And a question, a big question, is uh, we have um, in French uh, something like DT, which has um, sheets, uh, technical sheets, in fact, to, 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 to regulate the way to, to construct and to design a building. And maybe uh, this uh, material could be, um, to, could, could be fit in a neural networks to, to provide a, a graphic action made by architect and to make alerts from then. And this is maybe the, in a prospective way we are waiting for these kinds of tools. And it is a, a real situation and it, it is a, the, the, we are dreaming of these tools. And we're not, I think we're not so far because we have CSTB in France and uh, they are managing this material and uh, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big question in fact. So we, have, uh, we are in the situation in the last months we, are, we have uh, the, the, the fact is uh, several tools are uprising and the, let's say we have um, a speech to text which are already online and we have, um, let's say, I made for myself, I, I published my, my, my course with, which is a geometry, analytic geometry course because uh, the parametric modeling tools are already here and it is uh, impossible to, 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 to let the students outside this field in fact. And now with a simple prompt, I made a, a survey of my students on the, the question, do they know parametric, do they know uh, what is a, a, a rude surface, what is a, 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 a HP, a parabolic, a, a hyperbolic surface, and so on. And uh, I made exact, not so far the same question to the tools which are here with a prompted rule. And for the, 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 the situation is for now that students are better than the neural networks. But it is, um, the situation is going to evolve because uh, neural networks are, are learning too. <laughs> and we are providing the, 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 the knowledge to, to, to them. So. And uh, let's say there are several tools. It is, it is really. There was a few weeks ago, uh, the, these tools were, were not there, and we are in a prospective way dealing with this, uh, with this uh, situation with our students. And text-to-image exists, so the constant is uh, daily, for example, know about, knows about Le Corbusier, so <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant, in fact. 
and uh, and uh, Dali, for example, and but maybe also stable diffusion and so on, uh, knows about modern architecture. This is an example. And the last, very last uh, announced uh, tools which has been uh, arrived is the way is uh, we were speaking with our students about we're not going so fast to 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 wait for uh, let's say a text to model tools and uh, Nvidia has provided it in fact and uh, with a simple prompt you have a, a, a mesh and this is incredible in fact it has to be to be tested but uh, it's a um, it has been uh, in vain. And the question is, uh, if we can write something to, prov to, to design an architectural feature, uh, let's say those aesthetic is going to be disrupted by semantic. And uh, this is a big question because uh, the, in, the, in the stakeholders, the architects are very well fitted to, to, uh, with the, 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 vocabulary, the vocabulary of semantics because they know about architectonics. And um, let's say other stakeholders, maybe engineer doesn't know as well uh, this kind of feature, in fact. And the question is, does, um, let's say, the question is, do we have uh, to design uh, Something, or do we have to write or to enhance a project now? This is a feature, in fact. And this is a, an, an example. The zero shows the opera of Sydney. <laughs> so we have to test that, but uh, this is an answer. And um, so the, the, the semantic is a very big tool to get hands on this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this AI tool, in fact. So, for instance, we are working. Let's see, we have. Uh, I'm directing three, three um, theses, and we are in a disposal, which is a French one, which is a contrat cifre, uh, which is a triangle between academics, industrial, and um, and university. And we have uh, one of our students, which is uh, uh, this uh, this company, which is a society uh, association, uh, AQC, for the quality of the construction. And they have, uh, let's say, something li like uh, 25,000 data sheets on the sinistrality, in fact. And this material can provide, uh, fitted in a, we'll see the, what, what, we, what is going to be the result of the thesis. But uh, this uh, material, data material, is a really a specific one to enhance the knowledge by sinistrality and to provide predict, uh, something like um, prediction of uh, what is going to be suitable to design something or not, in fact. So, and we have also, um, we have built also a, a, a lab which is a, a data driven to make uh, <coughs> urban analysis. And this is, this is done by uh, open uh, library and open tools, in fact. And uh, it is already uh, working and we are, we are training our students on that, this, this, on, on that um, tools on, the, on that process. And the question is, well, here we, we are on, on Paris with data.fr, <coughs> uh, which is a, uh, an, open li an open data uh, provided by the city. And the question is, what is uh, the, the capability to enhance the height of the building? Yes, OK, I finished. So this is a survey of the three thesis. We have uh, one, this is uh, AQC, the first one. The second is um, uh, based on the air park and the way to, to build, a, um, a, let's say, a, a ash tall, a verti a v tall and ash tall, which is a, a situation to, 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 to make um, links between hyper density and rural, in fact. I understand, I, I, just, I, I just present this free, this free view. And uh, this is a question about um, Les Nouvelles Mobilité Aériennes with Avion Mobusin. And the question is to how to provide a service near upper density. And this is a question of air park, exactly. Uh, <coughs> I think it is uh, the end of my presentation. So the, the fact is urban analysis are already on the go. We are going to open a professional master and um, we're going to enhance the knowledge on a prospective way on that subject. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we've had a really a presentations of a wealth of different ways of using uh, AI very concretely in the architect's work and also some, some academic reflections and, and, and interesting to see also how students can be involved in this. Um, so I, I was thinking that uh, what, what I, I mean, what I think would be the most interesting thing to try to do throughout these sessions is to start off by asking you about the opportunities of AI. Um, so starting with the more positive note, understanding, so, so what do you see if you have to gather, you know, with all your wealth of knowledge and all the practical applications you've been, uh, been uh, presenting, what do you see as the biggest opportunities of AI right now for the architectural sector and profession? Let's start uh, from... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The, the opportunity is pedagogy and research. And we are, going, we are on that track. I, I, I answer up the opportunities. Our goal is pedagogy, research, and, um, and to train a, a professional on, on, that, uh, on that open, open uh, state and uh, landscape of tools, in fact. That's it. Yes? The opportunity that um, that we see is that um, technology can enable us to um, create um, better better lives, right? So uh, so we can use we can design spaces where people have uh, more time to to do other things because technology is taking care of some of our um, some of uh, some other aspects of uh, what we couldn't do before. So how can we enhance the quality of life and uh, the quality of the environment that we we, we design for. Yeah, similar like what I presented, I think the opportunity is to design directly for things that are traditional as a result of our architecture, like the thing, how you perceive buildings is sort of like, it's a result of a design process, but you don't design necessarily that. Um, so we can flip that, we can really uh, look at how people feel in the buildings, which is generally so complex to even start analyzing, but maybe with the combination of tools and AI, we can actually directly manipulate these things. Um, and I think also generally, like, we have this, like, every year we get a new computer in the office, which is much powerful, and we always hope we're gonna get things done fast and we're gonna go home sooner. Um, but what we end up doing, we just do end up doing more work uh, because we realize we thought we only wanted to have three options, but the reason we did only three options was that we couldn't do more of them, um, so we gonna the opinion is to inf like incorporate much more data um, that is related to the users of the buildings, which we didn't think we could before. Um, yeah. So, so I, I mean, listening to to all of you, um, what I see kind of on the top of it uh, as as something that is uh, seems to be really helpful in the architectural. Uh, sector is this uh, idea of making sense of a lot of complexity. So complex environments, complex spaces, uh, and also uh, making processes more efficient. But at the same time, I think that, I mean, when I look at this room, for example, it's a, a wealth of complex, not only information, but human factors and human being in environment, there's air, there's uh, faces, there's memories, there's cultures. Um, is there, a, and now I'm moving from the opportunities, is there like, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we ensure, and how we talked about balances earlier, how do we ensure that this, these um, very good ways of standardizing uh, the architectural profession and the methods that you're using, how, how do we make a healthy balance in this? I would say we hopefully not going to standardize anymore. We're going to be more custom to, you know, all the people inside. <coughs> so it's going to be more dynamic environment, more customizable, um, because I'm sure today design are biased towards certain group of people anyway, and that's the standards are. Um, so hopefully we're going to go away from standardization and go more for customization. Because then, I mean, an AI system, uh, I, I mean, an AI tool um, is very much designing right now for the mainstream. That's what I hear from my profession, working with the ethics of AI and also data ethics. What is happening is very much a design for the mainstream, the standard. And so in many of these kind of cases, 
when we're thinking about we're designing for people and, and cultures, uh, we might reduce it uh, to a mainstream. So uh, I'll let someone else answer also, but I can see you would really like to answer that question also. <laughs> so. Yeah, if I can add something to the topic. So um, uh, if, if we see it um, sort of technology um, in, a, in a positive way, in a sense where it allows us to do things that we couldn't do before, the biggest threat to it is our own knowledge of that technology. So we need to create more literacy of, of the technology itself, of what is under the hood of the technology to kind of um, be sort of aware of the biases, be aware of the, the ethics, be aware of that. So in fact, what we are doing today by just talking about it, it, it is actually the right thing to do because we need to kind of know more. So we need more masters in, in data li literacy for all the architects so to enable us to kind of to use that as a tool uh, in, and, and to do not make sure that that tool makes us again. Uh, and that, that, that is the scary part. So if, if, uh, if we can, and then that, that's the only way uh, we can create a sort of a balance. I agree with that, Philippe. Um, architects are in an open epistemology scheme, in fact, and it is a real quality. And I think that uh, sinistrated data, as I mentioned, has to be fitted in a, a BIM object, in fact. And um, this is a, 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 a real... Um, um, a real situation to, to, to and a real service to be provided to, to the architect and to the society as well. So that is, uh, I mean, very concrete uh, um, ideas on, on you know, what, how we can actually incorporate these more ethical, maybe social considerations. Um, and then if we think about one thing also that is general, and this is not only for the architectural sector, this is this idea of AI and the implications for the workforce in specific um, sectors. How do you see this? Uh, and also based on your experience from working in the field for many years, do you see any, any challenges, any opportunities that are, you know, in terms of the workforce and the employment in the field? There is a real challenge between uh, the gap and, and the, the deal between technology, data, and uh, public space. And this is a quite a, a politics um, subject, in fact. And uh, in an open mind and an with an open tools uh, um, situation, in fact. And uh, we are getting to to with uh, nos élus en français, je ne sais pas comment on dit en anglais, our, our policies uh, are major, in fact, uh, and in little town, and uh, this is a, a good way to, to, to enhance the quality of designing public space and so on. I got my own one now. Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to say, on the, I think we need to involve uh, new professions in uh, <coughs> in architectural offices. Um, I think we need to, at the moment there was a bit of an issue to get enough um, interest of the highly intelligent people in other domains, which architecture is not necessarily seen as the dream field. So I think we need to reach out to those domains and you know show them that we have super interesting, super important problems to solve. Um, so we get, so we attract uh, the new uh, you know, sociology, uh, computer science. Computer science is probably quite common today, but um, let's say AI, you know, the, the most intelligent students, they don't necessarily see architecture as the, the dream where they want to go. So I think we need to change that. And I'm, I'm sure we have, it's just they not are aware that we have super interesting and important problems to solve. The, the opportunity there is to re reflect on the profession of the architect in itself. So who is an architect? And well, that might not be the same architect as uh, um, Le Corbusier was. That's the, the future of the profession is not the same, although we still design, but there is an opportunity to, to take in uh, different disciplines, uh, such as so, so the kind of computer science, the technology, the sociology. So we can bring in different expertise to, to the value of, of this profession, which is uh, mostly a sort of a generalist 
the the architect traditionally is somebody that coordinates all different all different things. So how can we rethink the profession to make it more valuable and therefore then attract the right talent? Uh, how can we reposition this this in the in the in the field of of the things that we do? Can we make it relevant uh, for it? Otherwise, then we don't attract the right the right talent, the right people. Uh, and the quality of our built environment decreases, right? There's all sort of a, there's a down spiral to it if we don't do the right job as as professionals ourselves. I can add something. Uh, in there is a, a, a night time which is really important. It is nature, and we are working also in the process of re recycling uh, material and so on. And this is a, a real goal to 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 values, um, let's say, env environmental and sanitary. Uh, aspect uh, for society, so and we have the tools for to do that and to and to go on that track. So let me open to the floor and see if there's any burning. I see a few and one there and one there. So I think you were first, the gentleman here. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing presentations. I really enjoyed them very very much. Um, I have a couple of comments or questions uh, for you regarding maybe a common language understanding of how to talk about AI and architecture. Uh, maybe we can, I hope we can agree that one of the major paradigmatic shifts that are happening right now is a change from expert systems to learning systems. And considering that, it means that we're moving away from something of a top-down, let's say, parametric modeling method, which basically specifies what you want to have as a result and rather interrogate large data sets to understand uh, problems that we want to solve in one way or the other. Now, in the presentations we saw, the vast majority was actually parametric modeling that we saw here. Um, and I, I have to admit that I have a hard time uh, with a presentation that says AI does this, AI does that, without giving details like which algorithm was used, which data set was used, because those are the things that inform us as a community more than just, just saying that the AI this, this, did this or that. The other thing I want to comment is that AI is just an umbrella term, right? I mean, it's something that covers a vast majority, a vast area of different machine learning methods, algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. And I would appreciate more uh, specificity with this sort of information. So that's a very good question uh, regarding getting more you know, into the details of, and probably also will be practical in terms of when you're sitting as an architect, what kind of uh, tools, which kind of uh, services are you using, and then what kind of models? So I see you. I have, yeah, you, you I seem can, very I ready can, to uh, answer. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, reply to that. I think there is a in what I was referring with sort of the literacy of the technology. That's really where the the notion stands behind uh, behind how we communicate the things that we communicate. So often uh, there is. Uh, a lot of lack of knowledge of the technology that is behind uh, the things that we show, mm -hmm. and that literacy is is very uh, it's required to have a discussion of that level, uh, as if we would talk about the sort of data lake that we're using to 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 get a uh, information cross platforms where the, the smart city project that we're using, how did we build the, the data platform on it, uh, which uh, um, a cloud provider we're using, what is the choice of the cloud provider. So there is a lot of knowledge be behind that, and that's really the one that we should have time to, to dig into and, and really talk about. And uh, in order to equalize the, um, the conversations about it, uh, then we need to bring more specificity to the wider audience of the architectural industry to just even have a conversation. Uh. First, there is also two subjects. First, there is uh, the Digital Act, which is uh, on the go, in fact. So you have to, to be aware of that. And also, there is um, uh, these tools are, do, uh, are not on, uh, on the go, but they are not so far, I think. In a simple gest, a simple gesture, a graphic gesture done by a, an architect in the, within a software, we would like to have a, an alert saying, beware, you're getting out the, the, specif the, 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 the juridic or technical specification, in fact. And uh, this has to be done, in fact. And the, the assumption of this uh, assertion is 
to have um, a good quality of reuse, recycling, uh, the respect of the, of the regulation and the impact with environment too as well. So this is a prospective site. Uh, I just agree. I would yeah, actually be against ourselves if we don't talk clearly about what we're doing um, because it hides the opportunities and creates some misunderstanding. So we should uh, be more clear about that. I want to make my note on the, the difference with the, the learning algorithms. I think there's going to be something that probably designers will need to get used to because you know, the tools presented, we keep thinking that it's going to be something that keeps learning as the office evolves which is something completely new in um, design. You know, you're used to that. You have a tool and half a year later it's going to do exactly the same thing. But with these tools, there is a good chance, you know, half a year later they're going to be giving different results. Um, so I think something we need to get used to. I don't know um, what the implication is going to be, but I know it's going to be something, you know, you, you have, you're going to lose a bit of the uh, guarantee what it does. Uh, it's going to be more opportunities and we need to find ways to, to work with that. Yeah, it's it's very important in general to understand the granularity of the use of AI because if we want AI to be empowering, then we also have to understand, you know, uh, the, the the tools uh, that they that they're first of all they're not available to all, uh, and uh, they're very different forms, and they're definitely not neutral tools, all of them. And then uh, there's the literacies involved in this, uh, so that's a very important point. There was a question here. Yes, thank you. I have a question to Filip Filippo Lodi. Uh, you brought the slide that was one of the more interesting ones today. It was three columns. We had humans on the left side and uh, um, machine, and then in the middle, the merger between humans and machine. Uh, unfortunately, it was too quick. <laughs> so could you maybe make a recap on it? Because I think it, it it, it gives us the, what are the potential of the humans, what are the potential of the machines, and then what is the potential of merging it, which what we are talking about. So the, the, pers the perspective comes from the fact that uh, on one end, um, we know what we can do as, as human in terms of um, the process that we have in decision making and designing and collaborating. And we know what the machines can do, which is the parametric component, you give something the machine does, but you have no interaction with that unless, well, of course, you program that or somebody has programmed that, so that, that stands alone. And the, the effective intelligence for us is when we can create an interaction uh, between that. So either by having the machine support us in doing things that we don't, that we don't need to actually do and kind of uh, optimize, speed us up, uh, in, in the way, or really create um, sort of an augmentation of the things that we could possibly not do because we cannot think exponentially, we cannot have in, in seconds uh, um, results from, a, from, an, uh, from Watson, right? We are, we are not Watson, so we, we cannot, uh, so can we can augment what we do, the decision that we take as a human being because of that. And if we work very hard on that intersection where the two things are are there together i think that's where we can uh yeah create um uh, a far more interesting uh, results yeah and then i the interesting question for me is yeah, on the human side you had uh, the verb judge so humans are good in judging we are all agree right um, preparing this conference, we were joking about would it be possible you have an architectural competition, you have judges, and you have one AI judge. What do you think would have to happen that in, that AI judges would be possible? Or did you ever work well, on this? Yeah, I think that's a tricky question, but it would, if I, um, well, thinking out loud is uh, reflecting on what the first speaker of today talked about. If the, d the data that is used to judge is trained on the past, then how can we judge things of the future? That, that would be the, the main question to do, to, to do that. And so far, uh, that's a, the, different, the difficult relationship yet to create. So um, from, from our stand so far, the, the far more interesting one is if we combine uh, the human and machine, then we can create something. We can look at the future in a different way. Uh, 
by by tr by kind of speculating on things that don't uh, do not exist, right? And by not just looking at the sort of d data set, which is somehow uh, uh, an existence of the past, but if we could use it to kind of generate things on which they don't exist, and there are all sort of uh, loop there, but they are also always starting from uh, an existing data set, which is the the conundrum of 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 the whole um, of the whole uh, assumption so far. I, yes. I would like to recall I about your question and human uh, the three major paradigm of AI, which are classification, regression, and human supervision. And the last one is the may maybe the most important because all we are listening, uh, we are training the, the, the neural networks, in fact. And uh, maybe, in a, uh, uh, an, maybe it's, um, we don't realize this kind of thing, but uh, already with Google and so on, and uh, with the tools we have uh, on, od on uh, other uh, subjects, but fitted in the architecture fields, uh, there is a global uh, knowledge which is uprising, and it is uh, the society and human components from this way is a really important one. So I can add two kind of interesting, uh, I don't know if you could call it facts to this. Actually, someone did make an AI judge for a competition. A very, there's a very famous case of an AI um, judge for a beauty contest. And it turned out, of course, uh, when uh, when this uh, you know people had to send in from all over the world pictures, uh, and this AI judge was then applied. Of course, it was just a piece of software; it wasn't really a, a robot or anything. Um, was uh, to decide which was th which face was the most uh, kind of objectively most humanly beautiful one. And when it came out, it t turned out, of course, that it was incredibly biased. It only chose uh, white faces. And wonder why it was because it was uh, mostly trained by pictures of white people. So in that sense, you can see that an AI judge, uh, you know, I think that the learning thing from this is that an AI judge to judge something so humanly uh, kind of unique uh, and characteristic uh, would only be able to reproduce what humans already can do. Another part that I find really important to frame this debate is uh, the kind of the geopolitics and the regulations that are being created around AI at the moment. There is the idea that the EU is creating a kind of human-centric approach to AI in terms of governance. So there's a lot of reg uh, regulations uh, and also the AI Act that has this focus on creating um, governance structures and also use of data and, and creating data systems that are an AI systems that have this component of having the human and and it's not very like the human in the loop but the human in command uh, so via different both technical but also social and organizational aspects so that's a really important uh, point to to kind of make just, can I just add one? saying that we're in Brussels right I now it's interesting to think that I don't think just having a human end up doesn't necessarily mean it's not biased doesn't it <laughs> no, and and just to that we have an AI neither. So they, we have to find some combination that in some way will uh, ensure that, uh, not ensure because everything is biased, even an AI system is biased in the way that it always believes that the system is complete. Maybe but in a way the AI might help us to understand that what we think is unbiased is actually biased by showing that, you know, if you repeat, try to repeat the result, it's going to tend to have some bias on it. Could be. I would like to add s something. Um, we spoke about human supervision, but we can add software supervision with a simple line of codes uh, with Python's. You can put a, ser uh, a server not so far from a denial services. And as I mentioned, uh, from text, the, m the, the link between text, semantics, um, aesthetic, and maybe ethics, as we have to be aware with this kind of thing because with a simple lines, the power of a, of a, of a processor and a maybe a, a few processors, uh, you can uh, influence the, 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 the data knowledge and maybe put aesthetics outside uh, and to, to, disturb, to disturb it mm. and maybe ethics. Mm. <laughs> and this is a political uh, subject, in fact. Also. Yes, and technological and social. Um, so uh, I was wondering if there's any questions from our online uh, participants here. No, 
there's no questions. Well, uh, so we have the, any questions from the floor? No? Um, so, so let's, uh, you know, we have a few minutes left uh, and I'm wondering, um, so how do, uh, so AI architects or the architects that are using AI, um, so how, how, how do, you know, in ge on general terms, or not only architects in general, not only architects using AI or professionals working with AI, how is this perceived in the field in general, the uptake of AI technologies? Not so easy as a result, let's say. Um, in France, we're coming from uh, Beaux-Arts, uh, mood and so on. And um, this subject, we are a few schools in France to, to, to train our students, uh, but we are on the go and uh, we are working on, on so we are on a, a paradigm of displacement of uh, pedagogic um, models, in fact. So, Joseph? Um, well, I, I can see there is a direct relationship between the level of understanding of it and the level of excitement about it. Um, so I think the more you understand it, the more you get excited. Um, that's what's happening, at least in our office. <laughs> so there's lots of interest and the, there is a bit of a fear, but it tends to realize that's the people who, are, who don't actually have no idea how that works. Um, so I think it, need, it needs to be more literacy and just, you know, it's, it's a tool. There is a potential risk. We should keep it in mind, but not yeah, to be Let's clear about that. That's okay. Come on, Philippe. Um, uh, so, so if we refer about AI, on one end is the sort of the technology that we use as a part of the process that the architect does to do the architecture, and on the other hand is the technology embedded in the spaces or in the built environment that we that we live in. So it's a two different uh, it's two different worlds. Uh, one is more what some architects might be really uh, uh, super uh, energized by, by the topic and they have passion about it, uh, but they would require more knowledge to do it. And on the other hand is sort of the application of this field that as designer we can apply to the built environment to really um, capture uh, a different, um, different results, right? If we embed a full city with sensors and uh, we can uh, get information of all sort of things that are connecting to us, then um, it's less about us designing, y using that as a design tool, as a process for us as professionals, but it's rather what are the implications of that technology in the places that we design because that technology is inserted into it. And um, the, the second one, I, I find that further, far more uh, interesting than, uh, than the first one. Uh. Can I can I ask quickly, uh, and maybe also you can yes, answer yes, that yes. question. Okay. Um, so, if you're an architect, uh, and this is the very last question, because then we are off to lunch. Um, if you're an architect that really would like to use some of these opportunities, very concretely, advice. Um, what would what would you be uh, what would be your s advice? Uh, people that are really working with this and using the opportunities. Invite professional in our session in, a ma in our master. <coughs> we were yesterday in a, with the French Ministry of Culture in a seminary based on the chair. And um, this is a question, the loop between uh, pedagogic skills, research, and, and uh, practical. And uh, so the professional is really important. And uh, we are going to open this kind of, um, of training to, to the professional we are, we are invited. Uh, maybe at uh, Europe scale, welcome. So attend open courses that can Absolutely. help you. So that's that's a very good advice, um, Filippo. Um, uh, start a startup or do something in it that requires that technology to be bringing it uh, bringing it forward in a different way. So kind of be a bit more radical into it. Yeah, it's so like to start learning about it. There's so much on for free today online that you can just start being as like learning these courses online um, and reach out to specialists to learn about it, really. Okay, so those are all good advice. And then I would also suggest uh, that if you want to embark on using AI, of course, there's also the sites that we've been uh, 
the components of being aware of, of the social impacts and the ethical impacts and these things. So there's actually a very good uh, guideline for using AI in your work. The, it's called the ALT-I guideline, one that the high-level group for an AI, the EU high-level group created, that we created. An assessment list with questions you can ask yourself when you're using uh, AI to see if, you, if you're keeping an eye on also this human uh, relation. So uh, I just want to say thank you to, uh, to the three of you. Uh, amazing presentations, very interesting conversation. And now we're ready for lunch. Um, we will be back at 13.30. Uh, uh, and the lunch break is, lunch is where? <laughs>